welcome to Source Match's virtual roundtable. We'd like to thank you for joining us and uh, being part of this special event. Today, we're discussing the impact of the pandemic on career and education decisions. Our hope is that today's conversation will provide you with valuable insight as you respond to the effects of the pandemic in your professional life. I'm Gabriel Wilkinson. I'll be moderating our discussion and joining me are our esteemed guest, uh, Dr. Randy Wilt, lecturer at the University of Texas at Austin's McCombs School of Business, Armand Van Oostrom, Senior Lecturer on Supply Chain Operations Management at the Hague University of Applied Sciences, and Bogdan Negru, Vice President of Solutions with SourceMatch. Together, we want to answer this question. How do you go about handling your career and professional progression during this crisis so that your skills and experience are still relevant once the pandemic is passed? To start our dialogue, Randy is going to speak on something that millions of individuals have faced this year, career shock. Gabriel, thank you. And once again, we do appreciate everybody joining us for this roundtable discussion because it's a very relevant time for us. And the topic we're going to start off with is that the, the phrase, the career shock. And most people don't really fully understand what career shock is. And basically just a very simple definition of it is a, it's a dis disruption or some extraordinary event that's caused by some external factor outside of your control. And this is truly what's happening now. Now we see this happening all during uh, many, many uh, generations, but particularly right now with the pandemic, we're seeing this even more substantial. Now, when you look at career shock, you can divide it into four separate events. The first one is truly the event. The second one is how you have to change the way you think about things. And the third one is the sense making. The fourth one is taking action. So to break them down, let's just start off with that event. And when you get in a career shock, you have a minor, a moderate, or a major event. And of course, the minor event would be maybe uh, your employer says you need to start working from home because they're going to reduce down the cost of maybe the rent uh, in the corporate building. A moderate one would be that you're laid off. And we're seeing that happen quite a bit where people are being laid off. But when you look around at the competition in your industry, you're seeing they're still doing OK. So that's an event where maybe things are not as bad just because you see the opportunity to go elsewhere. But the major event is going to be where, let's say, your position or your industry is gone altogether. And that's going to be the case where probably the worst scenario. And we're seeing that happening right now with this pandemic virus where people are actually losing not only their job, but their whole company is closing or the industry is no longer necessary. And then you follow that with the way you get to change your thinking and then you get to start making sense of how these things are affecting you and your life. And then you have to decide to take action or not. And that may be you do take an action to change or you may not take the action. And that's the way basically the process goes for understanding career shock. Thanks for that, Randy. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, some of the events and maybe some of the uh, effects that you've seen uh, currently? Sure, and, and that's, that's a great point because you almost have to dissect down into what is actually going on that's causing that career shock. For, for example, when you look at the event, you, you can sit there and say the financial instability is causing various companies to start reducing their staff, and it can really affect you in the sense I'm saying here, let's look at one particular industry and that's the airline industry. Uh, you're sitting there looking at airlines all over the, the globe. They're starting to lay off people. Now, <clears throat> if you're in the uh, ticket uh, section uh, or maybe the gate section, you're a customer service person. So if you're being laid off, yeah, that could be a moderate because yes, you're being laid off, but there's other areas possibly you can go to. But think about if you're a pilot and most of the pilots in the world actually are commercial pilots. Where do you go to? If you're an airplane mechanic, where do you go to? If you're seeing that position actually being laid off and they're saying it's not going to come back until 2023, you're sitting there thinking, my goodness, that's three years from now. Where do you go to? 
And that makes you, forces you into sitting there thinking, do I need to change my profession altogether? Uh, do I need to go back for education, which Armand and Bogdan are going to be talking a little bit more about. Now, there's some other things you got to think about, and that's how does different things affect the industry that may be taking you away from your job? And as we've seen this pandemic moving, we're seeing that companies are embracing technology more than they were before. And I use the example of robotics because things before we were not really using robotics for if you went to the bank you had a teller uh if you went to the fast food restaurant you would have a person serving you but we're now seeing restaurants banks insurance agents everybody starting to move toward the robotics and i'll give you a, a great example uh in the united states we have the bureau of labor statistics and they said between 2019 <clears throat> a year ago in 2029 one of the fastest growing industry for people to work in is the fast food industry. Okay, that has completely blown out of the window now because what we're seeing is in these fast food industries that they're replacing it with robotics. <clears throat> so when you order, it's not a matter of a person who's going over there filling the cup with your uh, Coca-Cola now is being done automatically. And this is something that even the Bureau of Labor Statistics did not expect. And I read the other day about garbage pickup, sanitation workers. Uh, it, it seems to be that we're starting to experiment more, experiment more with robotics where the garbage truck is being driven, but you have robots coming off to pick up the trash. That sounds like very futuristic, but it's already being done. So here, think about the number of sanitation workers throughout the world and the country. You're talking about a position that could just totally disappear being replaced by robotics. And of course, we see that in things like manufacturing. But I have had people say, you know, uh, Dr. Will, you're, you're a professor. We always will need you. And then I read also where even professors, we're starting to look at being replaced by holograms. Wouldn't it be cool if you're learning the theory of relativity? You don't want to hear from a Dr. Wilt, but you'd rather see it a hologram of Albert Einstein with me as the moderator. So this is technology really improving education, but at the same time, is doing a career shock to even people like myself who are in education. And then the last thing I want to talk about here is total industries disappearing. Uh, we, we see that, you know, one of the things I've been hearing so much, Gabriel, is about that the travel industry uh, is being so effective. We will have no more business travel. I don't think that's true. I think we will have business travel. We will go back to a certain number of meetings. We'll continue to have a lot of Zoom. That's the technology. But think of all the people who were involved in business travel you know that's an industry that is shrinking very quickly and of course the retail storefronts we saw that with amazon and uh, alibaba when they came into the marketplace but now we're seeing it more because people are working at home and because they're working at home uh, they're more apt just to go on the computer and order so we're seeing more and more of these retail establishments that are actually dropping off the storefronts and if they do have a storefront Good luck finding yourself a, a, a sales clerk or a cashier because now instead of them, different stations throughout the store, they may have one central location and it's going to be like these grocery stores. You take your garments and you're going to go in there and you're going to scan it and pay for it and you may never see a sales clerk. Mm -hmm. So that's a great example how things are changing there. And the last one I really do want to mention is healthcare because I've always felt like healthcare is a very interpersonal relationship between you and the nurse, uh, the, the career a medical assistant, people in the doctors who are taking care of you. But again, I was amazed when I was reading about vital signs, you know, the, your, your heart rate, your blood pressure, no longer are going to be taken by a actual person coming in, but you'll have robots going from room to room. Just like now you may be permanently, uh, as you're in the hospital, uh, set up with a blood pressure cuff that's sending the message to the nurse's station. Now you're going to see, they're gonna go one step further where you may have the robots coming in there, checking on you, delivering the tray. And that's just like in the hotel industry, several hotels now are looking at, can we deliver room service with a robot? Two reasons, number one, it's a heck of a lot cheaper, but number two, you're not exposed to anybody, particularly in this coronavirus case, you're not gonna catch it from the robot and they're not gonna catch it right. from you. So this is a good example of how all this is really changing in what we call the events from the minor to the moderate and then to that major where the whole industry is disappearing. Mm -hmm.
And, it, and it's interesting, uh, I'd like to intervene here. What you mentioned here kind of reminds me of the discussion around the fourth industrial revolution. In a sense, do you feel like, you know, the fourth industrial revolution happened and, and we're talking about something else or is the pandemic actually accelerating the fourth industrial revolution? Well, again, that's a great point, and that's something people don't really think about a whole lot. Uh, and actually, I think it is. I think this is our fourth industrial revolution, and I think the pandemic has accelerated it very quickly. And the problem is, it's not giving people time to adapt to it. You go back and you think about the industrial revolutions of the 16th, 1700s, the, the 1800s, how people had a certain amount of time to to uh to understand what was going on, that all of a sudden mm -hmm. a locomotive. So now you have the benefits of getting on the train and going long distances like we saw in the 1800s, but we have a little different situation here. We're having now not things helping people as much as it may be replacing people or replacing mm -hmm. industries. And, and that does something that's very, very serious to us psychologically. Uh, number one, you know, people start seeing their pay being reduced because suddenly you hear you have a robot that is taking care of things. And uh, the nice thing about robots is that they don't take vacations. They don't call in sick. Uh, they don't argue about their pay, you know, so people are sitting there saying, you know, I'm being replaced and they're seeing their employees, uh, their coworkers dwindling, being replaced by people maybe being outsourced or maybe once again, that robotics. The other thing is, is that, you know, in the industrial revolution, as we're going through right now, uh, you're seeing your role change. You may be given more responsibilities, but no more pay. Mm -hmm. And what used to get done in eight hours, now you're finding yourself having to do more within the eight hours, or maybe you're going to nine or 10 hours. And then of course, like I said, you may turn and look next to you and that person who was your assistant, who was helping you is no longer there because right. no longer can the company afford to have all the people working on things. So they may give you more technological tools, but you've got to do it yourself. And I give you the example back when I first started many, many years ago, I started in the financial industry. And of course, like all uh, executives in banking, I had a secretary and I had a clerical pool. But I had a secretary who helped me. Nowadays, if I was in the banking world, if I had to construct a letter, I had to sit there, I'd go to my computer and do it myself. I'm going to be the one, I'm going to be my own administrative assistant. I'm going to be my own typist. I've got to construct all this. Okay. That's great technology. But then I look at all those people out there that have now those jobs have disappeared. And the last thing I want to talk about here in terms of the fourth uh, industrial revolution is that in the previous industrial revolutions, we still have people getting together. Now we're having people pushed apart. We're seeing more telecommuting, people working from home. And that is a very, very difficult thing psychologically because you may be find yourself getting up in the morning, sitting at your computer, at your home, your only friend is you're gonna be your dog or your pet, uh, who's gonna be sitting there next to you. You're gonna go eat by yourself downstairs. You may turn on the television and you go back and work some more and by five or six o'clock you're finished and uh, you never left your house. So psychologically, there'd be a serious problems with that. And this leads me, and Bob, I appreciate you mentioning that because that leads me over to the whole thing about how you have to change the way you're thinking about things. And very simply, <clears throat> one of the things we encourage people to do when I'm teaching in organizational behavior is that you've got a plan for the age 60. Now you've seen this for years and years in, in the insurance and retirement industry. Think about the day you're gonna retire, plan toward that. Now you gotta do that in your career. You gotta think about the age 60. So for example, if I'm teaching undergraduate students, 20 year olds, I'm saying you've got to plan out, not for five or 10 years, plan out for 40 years. And then also if you're 30, plan out for 30 years, 40 plan for 20 years, 50, 10 years, and you're 60, just keep planning because who knows when you're gonna stop working. What people don't understand is that today, the data tells us that every individual will probably go into the workforce, have 17 different jobs. That's amazing. My father told me, he said, you know, Randy, you need to have one or two good jobs and work there 30 years. That's not the case anymore. You're gonna have 17 jobs, which means you're gonna have a different job every three years and you'll probably have three careers in your life. Uh, I went from banking to marketing into academics. Who knows where I'm gonna go to from here, but I am seeing now that students who get a degree in business or maybe in technology, somehow they pop up in healthcare. Mm -hmm. And 
interesting as you're seeing this for people who were trained as a nurse later become a real estate agent, you know, and it's, this is part of that career shock is that you got to be willing to change back and forth as you're going. And this leads you into that whole concept of the many selves. And let me say that again, many selves, not many selves, but the many people that you have to be because <clears throat> you have to form yourself, not that I am, a banker, but that I am a customer service person who could do different things. I could be a banker or I could go in the healthcare arena or I could go into the science and technology arena. You have to form many, many selves. So that's been very, very important that we start realizing it as we're going through this whole culture shock. I think that's a great description, Randy, uh, that concept of many selves. We have to have versatility, flexibility, and just the willingness to change who we are and not get kind of locked into, you know, a 40 year position, which those don't even really exist anymore, do they? Um, Bogdan, I think that relates well to your thoughts about taking advantage of the pandemic in terms of career progression. Yes, it does. And, and you know, it, it's clear there are, and thank you, Randy, by the way, I think you presented a lot of the things that are happening around us at a high level, but also at a, at a personal level, and especially at the high level, uh, you know, part of things, there are things that we cannot control, right? There's the virus spread, there's the impact on the economy, uh, there's direct consequences for businesses that had to put the lock on, uh, people that have lost their jobs uh, and they need to work better, faster, more, and without any additional uh, incentives and, and so on, you name it. Um, however, there are certain things that you can influence that you have control over. And these are the things that I, I'd like us to look at a little bit more. And there are a couple of aspects that come into play, but really the, the time, the energy, the resources that you have control, there are around you, there are in your hands, your time, and so on. So that's where I'd like us to start. How do we effectively control those aspects that we have an influence upon? Well, there are there are two uh, major aspects to to this uh, to to that answer. And first of all, you have to look at, at the strategy that we need to have in place. Just like Randy indicated, if you look at the next 60, 40, 30 years, depending where you are in your career today, you know, and you are faced with this pandemic, if you don't have that long term lookout, then your first instinct, your first temptation is to, to pick up the first thing that comes at hand, the first offer, the first, you know, offer that has a salary that that perhaps saves you from the situation you're right in if you lost your job, for instance. However, uh, I'd like to make the case for a strategic approach to how you deal both with the pandemic as well as the long term. So put the strategy before any immediate actions in your career. That's the first point. Um, and, you know, the crisis is a perfect is a perfect situation uh, and context to just pause, uh, kind of hit the reset button and spend time to intentionally think about your career. The intentionality of it is extremely, extremely important because typically we, we just react to what's going on, you know, uh, in, in our environment. And so becoming proactive and intentional about our career is what's important. Um, and the first place you start looking at is really uh, just just be brutally honest to yourself. Are you fulfilled with what you're doing right now with within your job, within your current career? Uh, you know, are are are, are you playing to your strengths? Are you aligning those strengths with your core purpose? Is it is it what you want to do? Um, and asking these questions, or in other words, your your big why, is important because it's going to be the foundation for whatever you decide uh, moving forward. Now, once you've done that analysis of your core why. Then comes the time to look at where you want to go. You know, you just imagine if, if you shot an arrow at a, at a forest, it's pretty, you know, simple to think, look, I'm going to hit a, a tree. That's not the deal, right? Uh, the, the, however, nobody does that. You typically have a target on one of the trees and you start practicing until you hit the target. And why should you do any different with your career? So start by doing that with the, with the where. 
Um, and now that you have your why and your where, then start thinking about the future. Uh, and, and the last thing I'm going to mention at this point here, when you think about the strategy rather than, you know, rushing in into any kind of decision is write them down. It's extremely important that you have a plan, just like you do with a project, just like you do with anything important in your life, right? Put it down on paper. Armand, Randy, I'm curious about your response to uh, Bogdan's points. Well, I think there's something very interesting that Bogdan said about the why. I always look at that as the passion, too. Uh, we all have a passion. And sometimes our passions kind of start disappearing as we start getting uh, older with a family and uh, responsibilities like housing, things like that. But I always go back and remind people that when we were uh, probably all in third, fourth or fifth grade, we probably had to write some little paper that said, what do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> and you just keep adding to it. <clears throat> and uh, th th this was amazing because the other day I was going through some files. My wife says it's time to clean up some of this stuff. And so I was going through, I found this thing that I had written down the top 10 jobs I wanted to be. And of course, it went all over the board from being a teacher, which I am, to being a policeman. Uh, somewhere in there, I want to be a construction worker. But uh, it's not wrong to keep that list going. And because now we see ourselves entrenched in a certain career. And I went back and I started thinking, you know, if I was to write down now the, the five jobs, I think it'd be pretty cool to have. You know, then I'm doing what uh, Bogdan is saying. I'm shooting an arrow and uh, I'm going to take those instead of the forest, I'm going to take those five trees. I'm going to shoot an arrow and see which one of those five trees that arrow may hit and say, this is where I probably need to start thinking to go toward if my current position is falling off. Of course, that goes back to the issue of how do you get there? So at that point, Armand, I'm going to let you <laughs> add to what I was saying there. Uh, no, I, I think that that speaks uh, uh, really to to what we're trying to say that you have a certain control over your situation with all the uncertainty going around um, you most people feel that they're lost and if they don't take any action immediately they're gonna miss out on opportunities mm -hmm. um, it, and I think most people know from psychology that when you get under pressure, uh, you revert also to old habits. <laughs> so pressure doesn't always make us think any better mm -hmm. because thinking takes time. And that's what I really like about what, what Bogdan said. Um, do take the time to think about the next step. And then there will be time for action. Right. That's well stated. And speaking of time, Bogdan, your second point touches on a time element. Uh... Right. And well, the, the second point, really, after looking at your why, your where, you've put all that onto paper, you start thinking about the future. Um, and if you're like me, you, you don't have a crystal ball, you cannot see, nobody can guarantee you what the future looks like. However, if you're if you're looking at this uh, from the the proactive perspective, right? Look at those that do uh, watch the trends. They analyze the trends. There are many of them. There's you know McKinsey, the the Boston Consulting Group, uh, the World Economic Forum. They're always on the lookout for uh, trends in the world, and they're looking like 2025, 2030, 2050. And when you see those numbers, the first thing that you're going to start thinking about is like, why do I need to think about 2050? That's because those are very uh, high probability indicators of what the future will look like. So start by looking at these trends. Uh, and, and if you want specific industries, let's say, as, as uh, Randy indicated, if you have a passion for marketing, start following marketing. If you have a passion for entrepreneurship, stop. Uh, start following that. Uh, but look at them on a regular basis and look at what is the future most likely going to look like. Um, and working your way back from there, look at the kind of skills, the kind of roles, the kind of job uh, requirements that are going to be needed to fulfill those trends. And if you establish two or three of them that, that are slightly adjacent, then you have 
you have the, the possibility to set out a strategy for yourself. And so when you look at that delta between, you know, where you want to go based on those trends and, and where you are today, then you can start working and become the project manager for that strategy, for that career path that you've set for yourself and that intentionality that you have thought about. And so um, look at the, the, the project in itself. And again, 25, 60 years, you name it. It's huge. It's just hard to think about it in terms of 100% of probability. But break it down. Make some, some small milestones you can work with as of today, as of this year, as of the next month uh, to get there. Um, and an additional step is to validate it with experts. I mean, once you, des de you, know, you decide on the, the um, markets and, and the industries you're most interested in, then start thinking about who are those people? that I need to connect with that are there. They're the, the veterans of those industries that you need to validate your plans with. And that's where I would start, maybe it by LinkedIn or you know uh, conferences or whatever virtual events, uh, make sure that you use your time wisely to validate with the experts. And at this point, once you have that in your hands, you've got a plan, you've got a starting point and you've got your first step on your way to that long-term uh, strategy that we spoke of. So in order, just as a quick recap, in order really to, to think strategically about your career progression, even in a pandemic, start with a strategy. And then once you have the strategy, look at the future, make the delta of where you are today, put it on paper, and you've got a plan. That's well stated. And if any of our viewers are currently in that strategizing phase um, and are considering further education as one of uh, the steps they need to take, um, I'm curious, Armand, is uh, as a possible step in career progression, when is graduate education a sound choice for an experienced professional? Uh, that's actually an excellent uh, question and I'd first like to thank Randy for his clear views on, on what this COVID-19 crisis does to the world and what it, uh, what it means uh, to us. Um, and of course Bogdan, you, you already pictured that uh, you, you should be acting proactively rather than reactively. Uh, think strategically and that's where, where the education bit can come in as well. Well, first of all, let me just um, um, say that education is also an industry, um, and it it has changed tremendously. The the fourth industrial revolution actually also touched in this uh, this industry. So the, the it used to be let's say 10, 15 years ago, things were very clear. Um, you get your education, whether it's uh, uh, a vocational. Uh, undergraduate, uh, master's, MBA, uh, you go into a career and your organization will tell you what the next step is. Mm -hmm. They will tell you what is needed to proceed to the, the next uh, career uh, stop. Now, the online, uh, as we now see it in the COVID-19, that's, that's just given a big push on what was already there. We all recognize MOOCs as being reaching a vast audience. Technology enabled that. And once again, COVID-19 is accelerating that entire process. It's globalizing education. It's making, uh, it's so accessible. And it's, it's almost becoming a commodity. If you think of uh, parties like Coursera, that some of those courses are pretty good courses. You can find this in terms of knowledge. That's quite good. The downside is there's so much to choose. Where do I start? What, what, how can I assess the quality of the, the entire supply? Uh, and in terms of added value, and I'm just linking back to, to what Bogdan said, how does it add to my career, my career plan. 
And speaking of value, I wonder, given the economic upheaval we've seen in 2020, what should those who are facing financial difficulty do if, say, for example, a more traditional graduate education is appropriate for them, but it's beyond their current financial means? I, I, I love the question. Um, for, two, for two ways. One, it's, it's not a very simple one. Um, and second, it's, it's very... This is what is happening now. Uh, Randy also said, look, many people are facing uh, uh, a decrease in their pay. So, uh, and with education, we think of the Harvards and the, the Oxfords. I already mentioned Coursera. Um, so if you start there, there are things out there that are quite good in terms of knowledge. If you start finding those and link that to your longer term plan, you have an entrance. Right. But secondly, secondly, I would advise start looking then for platforms of people that do the same kind of courses. Interact with them. It right. will not only deepen your knowledge, that new network will also give you the chance to interact, to start thinking about what you just learned. Armand, uh, may I have a question of you? Because that brings up a great topic is as you're talking about Coursera and these online courses, some are synchronous and some are asynchronous. And you're saying it brings up a network of people. Uh, are, are you seeing more of the courses going one way or the other, or are they just kind of being blended all together? That excellent question. Great question. Thank you, Randy. Um, with the, the likes of Coursera, the, the major, majority is asynchronous. So uh, it's been recorded. Uh, you can look at that. And it, in terms of availability, accessibility, that's great. You can watch it in whatever time zone, whatever you want, multiple times. But it, it does bring me to what the, the added value of education uh, should be. And that's where the, the interaction comes in. And with asynchronous, uh, that's just not there. With the synchronous uh, online, then, then we get the interaction. It, I, I would argue that education uh, stops to be just about knowledge. That's readily available. We start thinking and add a value in giving context, in sharing experience with your peers and the, the professors in applying it, finding new situation scenarios. And, uh, Randy, to add to that, the networking even gets better there because the interaction with the synchronous teaching, to my mind, is much more bonding than the online asynchronous part. So thank you for that. And I, I'd like to kind of add to that in a sense. There's also this... Uh, um, idea and question that's being raised for universities themselves. You have the traditional uh, institutions, right, even private ones that, you know, are considered the, the top tier uh, universities for MBAs and so on. I do think they're in a process of being challenged about the traditional model just because, first of all, it's extremely expensive. So, uh, you know, we've started seeing a lot of universities saying, look, we've given up on the, the, the physical in-person course uh, and, and courses and we're transferring to online. Uh, more than that, you know, especially in the U.S., and I'm sure that this is true elsewhere as well with, with your initial question, uh, Gabriel, that it's it, you cannot continue as a university to charge the same amounts of money. Um, the, the, the financial pressure on everybody's lives today that most likely is going to extend and, and most likely worsen if we take the analysts to their word uh, until at least the, the end of next year, that's going to cause ripple effects in the academic world as well. So I do think that we're at a, a crossroads for traditional education uh, and, and institutions do need to come up with ways to compensate, like Armand suggested, look, you got to do synchronous or maybe a combination of synchronous and asynchronous and, and move the whole thing online. 
Um, and we know of a few universities that started this year and, you know, they ended after a couple of uh, weeks because they, they just started having too many cases of COVID. Um, so I do think that there's this is an actual opportunity also for the academic world to reset and find innovative ways to move to a system that supports the needs within the pandemic that I believe will also bring about how things are going to be dealt with post pandemic as well. And I think you bring up a good point there too, Bogdan. You mentioned earlier about an industrial revolution. This is kind of an educational revolution of sorts. Um, and, and I do think especially in the U.S. Um, where uh, higher education is not as subsidized as it is in other countries, whether it be in Europe uh, or across the globe, and there is that high cost. Uh, we've seen recent headlines of, of students outright protesting uh, the, the high fees of going to university when they're actually just staying at home and taking online courses. Now, on the positive side, uh, it seems like a great opportunity for more people to get more education um, more readily. Uh, so, you know, that's that silver lining, at least uh, that's kind of the feeling that I have about it. And may add Gabriel too, is that uh, when Armand was talking about Coursera, I had a, a friend whose child decided to take the Coursera courses, but I did not realize this, and maybe Armand, you do, is that some of those courses are set by major universities, and if you take the whole series of them, you can up, end up with a degree from a very, very prestigious university with ever going to the university, but learning there from some of their outstanding researchers. And uh, not that this is a commercial for Coursera, but I think we're going to find more universities starting to do the same thing where we're going to have uh, major researchers and they may be co-opting with other universities to offer this. And like you said, Gabriel, is that uh, the cost of picking up and moving to uh, to Boston, Massachusetts, and living there at that high expense, or can you take a course on Coursera from Harvard? You know, so I, th I think that's something that we always uh, are seeing changing constantly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's an increased added value to uh, to online learning, isn't there? Yes. Armand, uh, I think. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. That's a good observation, uh, Randy. Um, you, you can get courses from MIT. Uh, on Coursera, so um, the, the the divide for me is um, getting knowledge uh, versus learning, uh, and and that's that's where you uh, and I just circle back to what what, what Bogdan was saying. If you get your ambitious clear and and you share and sharpen that with people ar uh, around you. Um, uh, by the way, pick those people carefully. You want to get candid feedback rather than, oh, that looks yeah. lovely. No, it has to be really on the mark. So, and then start to um, use your networks to see the level, scope, and content. And yes, yes, Coursera courses might be among them, but that might not be everything. Um, if you look at uh, specific courses, what they don't do is what uh, I see is more and more needed. This uh, crossover, this intertwining of technology and business. Uh, business students without any hunch of technologies, the use of sensors or artificial intelligence, they will not know what they're talking about. Their business models will not be longer valuable. The other way around, I know all about the technology, but I have no idea how to apply this in, again, the real world. Again, the, if you look at those courses, those crossovers, that's, that's where the potential is, not just for uh, universities, but also for people furthering uh, their career. And, uh, to just to add to that, um, we've all heard about uh, lifelong learning. Learning doesn't stop when you had your uh, uh, formal education. Um, I think this is a time where we see the locus of control moving from the organization tells you what to do to the individual that starts to say, this is what will fit me. 
what will fit me in future. Just going back to what Randy said, 17 jobs over three careers, and it looks as if it's going to get a bit um, almost unimaginable that people would work for a couple of companies at the same time. Uh, a really networked environment. But if it goes through lifelong learning, but you have to plan it carefully. And that is exactly um, what, what I picked up also uh, from, uh, from what Bogdan was, uh, was saying. Absolutely. And th thank you for that. I, I, there's one, one, one aspect here that I'd like to add. I think the, the idea of continuous and lifelong learning goes well together with planning out your, your uh, career path. And the truth is that we all have to get acquainted with the idea that, look, education is not going to be a one-time degree you're getting that used to be. If, if, if we're taking the, the numbers that, that Randy has brought up uh, at the beginning of the conversation with perhaps 17 jobs, about three career changes throughout your life, then I guarantee you that you're going to have to learn on a regular basis yearly. I mean, set out time to learn, to grow, to work on you, not just on uh, for your job. So I do think that that idea of lifelong learning is extreme, extremely important. It's, it's like a prerequisite. We got to make our peace with it. It's not going to end. And by the time, you know, we reach 60, perhaps it's going to slow down, but not even then. So um, I do, do fully believe that. The other thing that you mentioned that I do think is also easily extrapolated is the need of technology. Well, if, if you're an international uh, professional, you, you know, and you think about working with the U.S. or the other way around, if you're in the U.S. and you're starting to think about working with China, you got to know the language or have an interpreter. But the, the point is technology has become ubiquitous across industries. It doesn't matter what, whether it's business. And I do agree that business is one of the crucial ones where technology needs to be there. And there's kind of a, a gap there that needs to be filled. But whether you look at healthcare, whether you look at law practices or uh, medicine, so it, it, it doesn't matter where you are, technology is going to be like an international language uh, practiced by everybody, used by everybody. Yeah. Um, and that is really important that there's really no industry. Just think about it. If you're in a restaurant, in a kitchen, you're still going to be using technology. So that's the other thing you got to make a piece with because you're going to have to pursue it intentionally. I think those are some excellent insights and a, uh, a good way to uh, kind of bring a bit of closure to this portion of our conversation. Um, let's take a few moments to answer some questions that were submitted by our viewers in anticipation for today's event. Uh, today's event. We've carefully selected a few of those. And the first one is from Zulika, who has a question for Armand. And that is, as educational institutions are transitioning to a more virtual learning environment due to COVID-19, what would be the ideal time for working professionals to pursue a master's of science degree? Well, that's, that's uh, uh, Zulika, that's a, that's a great question. Um, it, it is a, a complex one because it has various elements. Uh, uh, one, it says, okay, uh, we're moving to the virtual learning environment um, and then it links it to working professionals pursuing a master of science degree. Um, the, if, I, if I start with the latter, um, I, th I think, and that's what uh, we are arguing as well, that the technology and business, finding that intersection is, I think, what working professionals should be looking for. Um, I'm just thinking of my backyard here, the Technology University of Delft. Um, they have a, a, a master's in innovation and technology. And you see uh, students, masters and undergraduates, going there from both business and technology. 
so I, I would say as a working professional, um, after if you get into your uh, after your first step, you get into a more leading role. But maybe that's your third step. You will see more interaction between departments within your organizations, people working together, and that's the moment where this to say crossover can have the most impact the the more virtual learning environment will make it most of the time more accessible but once again i'd like to distinguish between getting the knowledge and learning find yourself a network a platform to interact and you will learn more and faster than just taking a course online Excellent. That's well stated, Armand. And I'm curious, I want to shift a little bit to, to Randy. You're also a professional educator. Do you have anything to add to what Armand has mentioned in uh, reply to Zulika's question about, uh, uh, about education? I think uh, Armand hit every nail on the head there. Uh, I think one of the keys to it too is education because Armand and I both are, we work at higher institutions, we look at degrees, but there's so many different areas that you can get certifications. Uh, so many different careers move toward certifications. And I, I have found the students who I've taught for years who have been in the working world five or seven years into it and they say, I want to go get a certification. And what they have found is not only did they pick up a kind of a different uh, realm of knowledge, but they found a whole new network. And particularly, I heard from one student the other day who said that they went for a certification and in sitting in the classes, physically classes, with people who were working on that same type of interest level, uh, they develop a network and those people's just said, you know, by the way, uh, we're looking for a person. Uh, we're looking, uh, would you be interested in applying for a job? Just out of the blue, in this particular student of mine, he realized he was about ready to be laid off anyhow because of downsizing of the corporation. So like Armand said, not only do you pick up your network in the academic classroom, but you can also pick it up in the certification process too. A great way, and I think if you're hearing one uh, one topic that just keeps coming back and uh, back up is the idea of networking. Uh, Bodkin mentioned it, very, very true. If you network, you'll be amazed how many people out there are either in the same boat as you are, or they have opportunities that can help you to further your career. And for that matter, even change your career and find something that you are very passionate about. Excellent. I have another question here from Ohad. I, I wanted to direct it to you specifically, Randy. Um, but honestly, I think we should open it up to uh, to uh, both Bogdan and Armand as well. Uh, I think that uh, you could all offer some good insight here, given your background. And that question, uh, again, from Ohad is, what is the emotional impact of online education? And I'll, I'll start that. And I'd love to hear what Bogdan and uh, Armand say. Uh, I have taught both in the brick and mortar. I've talked online. I've taught in the combination of both of them, a blended. I've actually taken courses. I have a degree that is from an online institution, a major institution that was doing an online uh, degree program. So I've, I've taught it. I've been in it. And I always tell people is that when you look at taking anything online, it does affect you emotionally. And sometimes it's good and sometimes it's a problem. So where would be a good situation? Uh, the good situation is, is that you have the freedom to do whatever you want to. You're not really restricted unless it's a synchronous. You have to meet at a certain time. Mm -hmm. So asynchronous, you can actually go in there and listen to the lecture after you put the kids to bed and it's 10 o'clock at night and your, your, your spouse has gone to bed and you can sit there and just you and your dog sit there and watch the lecture. Of course, the bad part about it is that you, you're not sitting in a classroom with people around you that you can do that word we say network. But <clears throat> anytime I teach online, I always tell the students is don't get frustrated if it's not working for you because sometimes it doesn't work. And I'm going to give you a, a very fast little uh, analogy here. I've got two sons. Both of them are in their 30s and they both have gone back for graduate uh, education. My youngest son, uh, he went back for a master's in business analytics and statistics. And he started online and he realized very quickly it was not going to work. 
He needed to sit in the classroom with the professor that they can ask questions back and forth. And he could turn to his classmates and say, I didn't get that. He could say after class and figure out, uh, you know, statistics is not easy. Now, the flip side of that is my oldest son, who uh, he's a commercial pilot. That's why I talked about the pilots a while ago. He is doing his asynchronously because as a commercial pilot, he will fly and sit in an airport for up to six hours waiting for his next flight. So he could sit there and read the magazines, but instead he is actually doing his classwork and uh, it works great for him. He could go be in a hotel in a different city and sit there and read all the texts, do, do the exams, whatever it is. And then when he gets back home, he's got the next two or three days when he's not flying, it's been all with his family. So in that case, it works. So this is the emotional part about it is that you've got to figure out if it works for you, if you understand the knowledge and the content, and then what is the best situation? Is it to go to the class or is it to be online where you actually are sitting there having all the freedom unless you get one do the combination and that's the synchronous where you're actually watching the professor maybe uh, uh one uh one hour out, out of the week and then doing the other part asynchronous now i'd love to hear armand's thoughts about this too because Ar armand's very i mean i know you deal with online too yeah it's it, it's inevitable uh, i would say um the, the the aspect that i i've observed is that um, um the the interaction with with students um if that's lacking uh, their and their involvement gets less they find it much harder to motivate themselves uh, there's a bit of a difference between the professional because the professional has a sense of purpose more than let's say the uh, uh 20 year old uh the however the, the, uh, the if you if you stick with online education you have to find a decent replacement for that lack of direct interaction and uh, i'm sorry i'm just circling back to the synchronous education where you have smaller classes but in a workshop setting and sorry the educational term is flip the classroom they prepare something up front and it's the discussion the deepening you do that's the value and then it helps and then it also helps to lessen the emotional the negative emotional impact of online education bogdan do you have anything to add uh in terms of uh the emotional impact well and, and again I, I appreciate uh randy's and and armand's input on this from a business perspective it's well known that companies are starting to, to, to feel that they're missing and they're seeing their teams uh, drop in terms of creativity and innovation because of that informal interaction you've got in the office, right? So there's the water cooler talks or just like you do in class to ask your colleagues, I didn't get that. Can, how did you, you know, take that information in? And so all of those interactions are well known to fuel creativity and different perspectives and so on and so forth so in a way uh, the the challenge today for businesses and leaders whether regardless of the industry whether it's education business or you name it nonprofit uh government you have to think about ways to compensate for that and i know i know companies that are intentionally putting time on the team's calendars for informal discussions and happy hours. And, and yes, they do have their limitations, but for, for many of them coming back to the office is not an option. If anything, they are on an indefinite decision to not come back to the office. So, you know, there, there is a challenge to come up with different strategies. And I do think this is going to work very differently, differently for each company aside there's no one size fits all for this um but you have to work out you have to come up with ideas and the first place i would start especially in the business setting go and crowdsource ask your team what do you think would work uh and start with that pick up a few of them and and start charting a few a few trial runs to see how that goes um, but it is definitely a pressure that everybody's feeling and we're we're missing 
that in-person interaction that adds so much more value and social interaction that adds so much value to everything that we're doing. It's like we're incomplete uh, in, a, in many ways. So uh, I do agree this is a, a major challenge right now. And I think that's a good point that it does stretch far beyond education. It's it's into almost every aspect of life these days, isn't it? With uh, the social distancing that we're having to face both physically and on the emotional level. So thank you to Ohad for uh, a great question that opens up this uh, good conversation here. We have time for one more question and uh, it comes from Tristan who asks, what areas uh, of opportunity are opening up for young professionals? I'd like to uh, to answer that. If uh, and and one of the, the the ways I would look at this is is simply similar to, for instance, how governments reacted to the pandemic. They looked at essential uh, areas of the economies uh, that they are uh, responsible for. Uh, there's healthcare. There's uh, the food. There's uh, supply chain. Believe it or not, and. I remember specifically thinking about this when we were in the pandemic, there was a lockdown even in Austin and across the, the world. Uh, it was interesting that the the stores still had food on their shelves. And it dawned on me, somebody was going out and doing those things. The supply chain, if anything, didn't stop. There was even more pressure. People were scared, they were ordering more and so on and so forth. So all of a sudden that supply chain uh, you know, was still there. So all these things that are critical, healthcare, food related industries. And I believe Randy mentioned the online ordering and restaurants, for instance, can becoming creative and coming up with, you know, let's turn from the restaurant to making sure that we, we, uh, we sell flour and, and oil because we already have our suppliers. So that was quite creative. But all those things are, are industries that I think we should be looking at. These are the critical ones that need help today and in the next 18 months. And if you want to think even on the longer term, because I do think that whatever changes are going on in these industries are not going to be happening within the next 18 months alone. Yes, we're starting. It's accelerating right now. But think about technology as, a, as kind of the fourth industry that I want to mention today, because when you think about AI or what Randy mentioned, the robotics, that has uh, very wide effects across the economy. And, and you're looking, there's no industry where uh, people aren't thinking about, OK, how do we make things run faster, better? without human intervention. And just coming back to supply chain, there was this whole concept of low touch, uh, low touch economy where you don't have to actually interact with a person to be able to do anything across the supply chain from the supplier down to the actual individual who gets the food at home. They don't have to interact with somebody. And I do think that technology needs to support that. If you look into healthcare, for instance, right, we were mentioning about all these devices, these sensors that, that transmit in real time, uh, uh, that also transpires into telehealth, right? So it, it's, it's now, if, if before the pandemic, people didn't think about uh, doing tele, uh, you know, uh, visits with their doctor, today it's the standard. So uh, you look at hospitals or pra med medical practices that had to find solutions. I remember we were at a, an emergency room a, a few months back with our son. And, and the thing is, uh, the, the doctor brought in, like on this pedestal, this tablet that had a direct live feed to a, a person, a lady that took our uh, personal data. She wasn't there at the ER, but she was at home somewhere in another state taking our information in. All of these things, they require technological support. So all that that's going to be another industry. I do think technology will have to support development and, and all this transformation required in, in these basic industries. And that's where I would start to look if you'd like to, to think about making a decision. And I'm sure Randy or Armand might, might have their own input on this. 
The only thing I was going to add to that, Bogdan, is that for a lot of business, uh, people who are in business, we don't realize how we manage projects every day. And that is a growing area, uh, project management. And there's multiple degrees out there, master's degrees, are a one-year program uh, that will teach you how to manage projects in manufacturing, all the ways to uh, homeland security, to electronics. Uh, and it's an area that I, I tell people quite often is that you don't realize you've already got the talent. You just need someone to help you to fine tune that talent. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a great career to move yourself into because as we move, as Bodkin says, as we're moving forward, every industry is looking for project manager. So I just want to add that to that, to, to, to the list in addition to your supply chain. Mm -hmm. And even further, I would say businesses need young professionals to keep in touch with society. If, if you don't have a diverse workforce, um, that, so I think that companies will be looking for young people to come in and they do have a comparative advantage and in, in using technologies if i just look at my on my children how they use well every device in the house um that is they make it look so easy uh, well i go I, i'm still one finger typer if, if you will um th thanks uh, great thoughts randy bogdan thanks and let me reiterate that. Uh, thank you all for those insights. Uh, it's definitely some useful knowledge for for uh, our audience. And to bring our conversation to a close for today, what would you each recommend to our viewers as the number one action point that they can take today? As I started, I guess I will be the first to end it here with uh, the takeaway. In my case, uh, the takeaway is reaching toward the age of 60, uh, planning toward that 60. If you remember, I said you're 20, don't plan five or 10 years, plan for 40 years, realizing things are going to change, but at least you've got a plan. If you're already 60, just keep looking forward with things. Uh, the old idea that, you know, hey, just go with the flow, that doesn't work anymore because it takes a little bit to get education. Uh, it's going to take you two or three years to go out there and get additional education or to study for certification. So you've got to start planning a little bit out to think about how I'm going to get there and where I hope to be in the next few years. And of course, things will change. Uh, a family, you have another child, you decide you're going to move, buy a house someplace else. But as long as you got a roadmap, then it really, really reduces the stress down in your life as you're planning to go forward. Mm -hmm. And I'll continue to take your lead here, Randy. I do think that the one thing or takeaway that I'd like our viewers to, to, to take from this is the fact that you have to be intentional about your career. Um, whether you're looking at 60 or 70 or 100, I had a friend tell me the other day, I, I plan to be here on, until I get to 100. What's afterwards? I don't know. But just think intentionally about your career and put it on paper. That's it on my end. Armand. So, yeah, from my side, I would say uh, make sure in, uh, education is an integral part of your career planning. Um, experiment because there's a, a, a lot around. Don't be afraid to step into. So it's a bit like the example Randy gave. You you start something, you find out no, that's not for me. That those opportunities are there. Um, so build your education into your career plan, but make sure you keep networking. The learning is from the interaction not just from the knowledge. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, thank you, Randy, Armand, and Bogdan for your time and for sharing your knowledge with us. I'm certain our viewers have found this to be time well invested and are now better prepared to continue forward as they respond to the pandemic and keep their own career paths on track. Uh, and we'd like to thank our audience. We appreciate your interest and participation. Stay safe. And we wish you a wonderful day and success on your educational and professional journey.